simple person, I'm not a specialist in this area, and you can understand what I'm going to be talking about basically just because I can, as far as this presentation is concerned, I guarantee. Uh, I end up thinking that real GDP, a little bit like the fiscal balance when we talk about MMT, should be just whatever it needs to be to meet the public purpose, to provide people with the means, giving them the best possible chance of having a good life and of not risking the opportunity for their children and grandchildren to have good, li good lives in years to come. So wh what do I mean by the public purpose? Well, um, Phil and I were talking to Jeff Harcourt a couple of weeks ago. He's been referred to quite a few times uh, 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 um, in this uh, conference. And I happened to write down something he said as he said it. A necessary but not sufficient condition for a civilised society is that it must try and create full employment. I agree, there's an enormous amount of evidence of the damage which particularly involuntary unemployment causes to people. I mean, not just in terms of suicides, but that is a fairly arresting statistic based on a, a sophisticated piece of statistical analysis and published in a very highly rated um, journal. 41,000 suicides globally due to unemployment before the financial crisis. Sure, that increased after the financial crisis, but these problems are with us always. Surveys of life satisfaction, there are lots of problems with them. How do you go about identifying the level of subjective well-being which people experience? What do you measure? What question do you ask? If you're going to ask people how happy they are, how do you go about doing it? If you're going to ask people how satisfied they are with their life, it's a different question. It will affect the results you get, but pretty much it doesn't matter how you ask the question. You always get the same answer in terms of unemployment, which is that it has a, 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 an almost unique impact on people's subjective well-being. We never adapt to involuntary unemployment. People don't even adapt to having been temporarily unemployed. Virtually every other life experience, good or bad, we do adapt to over time. Not persistent pain and not involuntary unemployment. <coughs> So, secure and equitable em employment, access to decent health care, which uh, a lot of people in this country could do with, access to decent education, a safe and sustainable environment, well, whatever else we define as being part of the public purpose, surely they must be part of it. There are good reasons to be at least agnostic about growth in real GDP, the ecological constraint which people are talking about here. Further growth may be unethical, or as Philip was discussing in an earlier panel, even if it's not unsustainable, it may be because of the costs associated with growth in real GDP, it may be uneconomic. And the Easterlin paradox, you might have heard of the Easterlin paradox, it's been very controversial ever since it was first discussed during the early 1970s. How come if real GDP per capita in the US has been growing on average at 2% per annum for a long time, how come people aren't any happier? Uh, is it inevitably the case that our aspirations rise over time, that we need to consume more goods to be as satisfied with our lives as we were before? Or is it something else? Um, some people say MMT is not political and doesn't have much theoretical content. And when they say that, they're discussing what I discuss in banking classes, really, which is about how the monetary system works. Once you add a job guarantee, of course it becomes political. Once you add a job guarantee uh, and you talk about the role of the job guarantee in stabilising an unstable economy, in offering as an inflation anchor, as obviously being uh, superior to a, a standalone universal basic income just on those grounds alone, then the nature of MMT has changed. But I think MMT should be a bit more imperialistic than this. When I talk about what I mean by well-being and the public purpose, then I still, to my students, I'm still talking about modern monetary theory because everything is always centred on the monetary system. And when you take ecological constraints into account, I think the Binzager Institute does this. Basically, the Binzager Institute um, provides discussions of ecological modern monetary theory. So whether you're talking about base MMT, whether you're talking about ecological MMT, it's all MMT, it's all relevant to this 
conference. Philip put this chart up earlier in the day. He was a tiny bit out of date. He said, even though he's a great expert in this area and I'm not, from the Global Footprint Network, um, adjusted for uh, the, uh, e the biocapacity of the planet, um, we are well into ecological deficit. And we've been in ecological deficit as a planet, according to the scientists behind the, the Global Footprint Network, since about when the limits to growth was published in the early 1970s. Why was he a little bit out of date? He said we'd need 1.6 Earths in order to sustain our current level of economic activity. And in fact, the most recent figure is 1.7, actually, and it's still rising now. If you're talking about the US, you need, according to those scientists, you need about three USAs to sustain your current level of economic activity. If we're talking not about production but about consumption, if the world as a whole was to consume what an Australian or an American consumes, these scientists tell us we need more than five planets in order for this to be sustainable over time. Now perhaps these people are wrong and I, I want to be agnostic and sceptical, but can they be that wrong? How wrong can they be? Um, this diagram is based on a a, a diagram from a popular book which somebody called Kate Roweth published uh, recently called Donut Economics, which uh, there are bits of it I don't like because she doesn't understand modern monetary theory, but there are bits of it that I like a great deal. Uh, the idea of the donut, we, we imagine economic activity starting from the middle of that donut and moving outwards. Now how big an economy do we need? How much economic activity do we need? We need enough to meet people's basic needs and give them the opportunity of a good life. How much that is, well that's going to be uh, a distributional issue, really. But we need to avoid going beyond our ecological capacity. Our ecological capacity of course will change over time and that's uncertain too and to an extent that's an allocative issue. What types of goods and services do we produce and to an extent it's a technological issue. How do we go about producing those goods and services. Can we have a clean energy system? If we have 100% clean energy, it will not make this problem go away because that's not the whole story as far as our ecological footprint is concerned. Um, now, having said that, what's the point of all this anyway? Do you want to double the size of US real GDP over the next 23 years? What would be the point of doing that. There are many problems, like I said, with measures of subjective well-being. Um, uh, but, regardless of how you go about doing it, you get these kind of answers. In general, yes, higher income people tend to report higher life satisfaction. How much of that is just a social comparison effect? Like a sort of consumption arms race. You know, we could go back and talk about people like Veblen and Duesenberry and all those people from the history of economic thought. Um, higher income countries tend to have higher average life satisfaction. But again, how much of that is about status? What would you feel as far as the US was concerned if the US was not a relatively high income per capita country? How much is it is about that kind of thing and not about the enjoyment that you get from consuming that big pile of goods and services that you and I consume? over time. It's less obvious that rising incomes over time in already, already rich countries increase well-being. That's basically what the Easterland paradox was about. Rising GDP per capita, rising income per capita over time and people apparently not being happier with their lives. Now, I, actually I think I'll, this is a, a little bit of behavioural economics or a nod in the direction of behavioural economics here. I don't want to spend more than a moment on, on this really but if you do ask people how satisfied they are with their life or how happy they are with life or you do something like try and measure how much of the time they feel stressed or how, much, how, how many times they smile and how many times they frown over time, how you go about doing it determines the extent to which you get a result which is instinctive, a system one type of result or more deliberative where they're thinking about their life as a whole. But even if you ask them to be deliberative and think about their overall life satisfaction 
they're still influenced by their emotional well-being. And there's a lot of evidence that the way in which we react to these type of questions is linked to Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky's prospect theory, even though that was a theory about decision-making under risk, and particularly to their subjective value function. Um, we are reference dependent. How you feel about an outcome depends on how you feel what you expected to happen, or what comparisons you'll make, and it's subject to framing. If things turn out better than we expected, yes, that makes us happy. If things turn out worse than expected, that has generally a much more powerful psychological impact on us. Yes, if we feel we're being unfairly treated, if we're doing worse than uh, the people we're surrounded with or the people we compare ourselves to, that has an impact on our well-being. Now, uh, uh, the Gallup World Poll is uh, a famous poll of life satisfaction amongst many other things. They use the so-called Cantrell scale to ask people to rank their feelings of life satisfaction between 0 and 10. And what you can see is a sample of uh, well over 100 countries there with a few just highlighted for you. And just looking at that chart, it appears to be the case that it's important in terms of reported well-being to increase real GDP per capita until you get to about the income of Spain. Um, you could, like Daniel Kahneman himself and Angus Dayton, a Nobel, another Nobel Prize winner pointed out, take logarithms of what's along the horizontal axis and show actually that even people in very high income countries, according to their research, are still saying they're happier or more satisfied with life anyway as their income per capita increases. But I could say, well, no, not really. Let's just take the countries above Spain and see what the effect is. It's not clear to me that countries with a higher real GDP per capita are significantly on average, uh, 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 more satisfied with life or, or, or happier. And uh, as I said, you could raise all sorts of philosophical questions and, and, and say this is not a very valid thing or scientific thing to talk about. But if people are not happier, then what's the point? I mean, I know it's difficult comparing these things in different countries. There are all sorts of cultural factors involved and a variety of things affect how people respond to these surveys. But if you look at just one country, the US, and if you look at a variety of surveys where the question about how happy you are or how satisfied with your life you are is, it has been asked in different ways, you get a kind of similar effect. Americans are not becoming happy. Not if you ask them. How else are you going to judge but ask them? What's more, and this um, conflicts with a lot of um, sophisticated statistical analysis, but if you're relatively simple and you look at the answer to the question given by people who either are classified in or classify themselves in the top 50% of the income distribution, those in the bottom, the gap between how happy those at the top 50% and those in the bottom 50% are appears to me to have been growing over time. That's Australia for you. We don't seem to be becoming happier there either. That's Spain for you. As GDP increased in the 90s and early 2000s, and everybody was optimistic about European integration and all that because they didn't understand monetary sovereignty and the problems of the Eurozone. Sure, it appears that on average perhaps the Spanish were getting happier, but looking at the whole period, again, in Spain, if anything, people seem less happy now than they were in the late 1980s, and yet they've got more income. In China, happiness perhaps fell as we moved towards the year 2000 with all those economic reforms and the withdrawal of the employment guarantee that uh, Yang Yang mentioned earlier, we then have, well, yes, in lower income countries like China, economic growth or growth in real GDP per capita does seem to be associated with uh, rising happiness. The point of all this is that real GDP per capita and measures closely based on it, although the Human Development Index has a uh, gross national income, not gross domestic product, but really they're not all that different in most cases, are entirely inadequate as measures of sustainable economic progress. Philip, who is sitting here, is one of the pioneers 
in estimating for different countries and different regions the genuine progress indicator, which takes personal consumption data and adjusts it for about 25 factors, some of which are benefits, some of which are costs, environmentally or socially, of economic activity. A group of concerned scientists recently published a, an article, which there's a chart from on the right-hand side there, looking at the world as a whole. Yeah, sure, GDP has been rising nicely over time, but the genuine progress indicator, which obviously I haven't got time to explain to you in detail how it works now, um, has not, if anything, it's been falling. Now, Daniel Kahneman, back to him again. He's talked about focus illusion. If you think that lost GDP is the best way of talking about the cost of unemployment, well, this Nobel Prize winning psychology as well, economist, there's no Nobel Prize for psychology, um, wouldn't agree with and people talk about Oaken's law as though it's the idea we have to grow the economy or unemployment will rise. Um, well, absolutely. But we need to break Oaken's law. If full employment is important, we need to find a way of providing people with the opportunity to have worthwhile employment without necessarily growing the economy. That's a distributional issue. It's an allocative issue issue, it's something we need to think about. And over time, as productivity grows, when people have that security, then perhaps we can encourage people to work fewer hours and move towards Keynes' grandchildren. He was talking about in that 1930 paper, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Because unemployment hurts. I haven't got time to talk to you about these papers, but there's lots of papers like this. I can give you a whole reading list. And I'll tell you, unemployment hurts. They'll tell you, if you just replace people's lost income when they lose their jobs, that's nowhere near enough. You need to give them an enormous sum of money on average to compensate them for the impact on their well-being of, of, of lost employment. There's a couple of um, examples. Even if the loss of a job is temporary, it moves your life satisfaction apparently for a long time, perhaps permanently. Uh, if you remain long-term unemployed, there's very little evidence of any adaptation at all. That's very rare in terms of life events. Uh, I won't read through that. Now, basically, this is the story, sort of averaging out a lot of studies. The lost income, or just taking the loss of income from job loss, has a significant, but largely, in many cases, temporary impact on how people feel day to day what they're talking about day to day, unemployment has a much more severe impact, even if you compensate people for the loss of income. That's what these psychologists with their studies tell us. Finally, what about a successful, cohesive society? What about keeping inequality under control and reversing the amazing level of inequality that you have in the US? You don't have developed country inequality. You have basically um, underdeveloped the economy inequality. That's what's happened since the 1970s. We need to think about attitudes towards other people. Why is this acceptable? And now, the psychologist, George Langenstein, is amongst those people to have addressed this issue. He did it before most other people, and he, 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 he did it using experiments um, identifying how our attitude towards advantageous inequality and the well-being of others depends on how our relationship with those others has been framed. If we see our relationship with others as financialized, as economic, as competitive, on average, most of us, not all of us, but most of us feel mildly happy if we do better than the average. If, we're, if we get ahead of everybody else. That's important in countries like Australia where we've moved away from state pensions for the elderly and towards private pensions. What does that do? It makes inequality in old age acceptable. If I've got ahead of you by the time we're both 70, or in some of your cases, by the time I'm about 120 and you're 70, <laughs> then uh, in a private system, not everybody will feel like this, but the people in the middle of the distribution, who decide to win for the elections. 
They tend to see it as a good thing. You know, if you haven't saved enough, it's your fault. Don't expect me to look after you. You're a leaner. I'm the worker. On the other hand, if our relationship with towards others is framed differently, if we see them as part of the same community as us, if it's a social relationship, not a financialized relationship, we tend to have different attitudes. Those of us in the middle, anyway, whose attitudes are malleable, we don't like advantageous inequality. We certainly don't like um, extreme advantageous inequality. There's a lot of evidence that this is the case, not just from George Lowenstein, although I do like his work. I asked my students before coming here, some of them just quickly in the middle of a boring banking lecture, I said, hang on a minute, suppose you're making $50,000, suppose you don't understand MMT and I tell you your taxes are going to pay for this. I did say that to them. I said, let me just describe a job guarantee and then we'll think about an unconditional payment. And I said to them, you're making $50,000 after tax, how much would you pay someone who is part of the job guarantee? We we're performing some tasks for the community and we gave some examples. And the median and the mode, both of them, uh, amongst the options I, I gave them, was $30,000, not a king's ransom. But when I talk about an unconditional payment, then I got an amount which is actually less than what the unemployed, as long as they meet a few conditions, get from the conservative Australian government at the moment. So if you think a universal basic income is going to keep people out of poverty, it won't. It will be seen as welfare, it will be squeezed down, politicians will tell people who are paying more in than they're getting out, it's costing them money, and that's the kind of result you'll get, and you'll lose all the non-pecuniary benefits. Okay. Well, finally then, what should you build in to a job guarantee? Well, it's obviously got to be green, but it needs all these kind of characteristics too. Psychologists have done a lot of studies, again, so we kind of know what people enjoy about going to work and the experience of being in employment and what they lose. And here's the summary for now, for when I run out of time. There are definitely ecological limits to real GDP. I'm not qualified to tell you what they are. That's why I'm agnostic. It is, in my view, definitely the case that real GDP per capita in terms of the quality of people's life doesn't matter as much as other issues in high income countries. Losing your job for much more and for much longer than the loss of income, we know that. I mean, it's just beyond dispute. Um, attitudes to others are subject to framing. So what can a job guarantee do? It can eliminate involuntary poverty, it can mitigate the impact of unemployment, it can shift attitudes to others, and it can be a step on the way towards what might eventually be a steady state. We can't we can find, we can't grow our economy in Thanks very much. Hello everybody, I'm Roman Schwartzman, a PhD candidate at uh, McGill University in Ecological Economics and the research scholar at the Economics for the Anthropocene Research Initiative. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the concept of Minsky in the Age of Planetary Boundaries, which is an ongoing project I'm working on that aims to better connect somehow the, the current state of financial stability seems to move, um, with the, the current state of ecological fragility. Um, if we look at what has been done somehow between MMT and ecological issues, uh, it's fairly recent. Until a few years ago, the, there was next to nothing, I would say, and we have uh, the Binzager Institute and some work that has been done. And what I would say is that most of the work we've seen so far had a focus that was either on um, a risk management approach, really try to, trying to um, assess the cost of climate change, mostly, for example, through the development of uh, ecological stock flow constant models, uh, and a second one that was more that is more based in on opportunistic approaches. So for example, how green investment or green jobs could be a way out uh, of economic stagnation or a meaningful way out of, economy, of, uh, of stagnation. So the dominant approach has really been to treat um, 
nature in general or the environment as an external issue or kind of like add-on to a set of existing theories. And what I will try to do today is really reverse that a little bit and come to MMT from the perspective of another, another school of heterodox economics, which is uh, ecological economics. And Stephen has been talking a little bit about it, Philip as well, uh, earlier today. Um, I would say that there is not an obvious fit between MMT and ecological economics. We can try to make it sound nice and, and see how they can mutually benefit from each other. Uh, however, I would say that if we think about the monetary economy of production, uh, what an ecological economist could say is radically different is really that socioeconomic systems are not based on money somehow, but really on the extraction on energy and material and the generation of waste. And this is an inherent or inevitable um, socioeconomic process that is generated. Um, however, I think it's important to try to connect these two schools of thought if we want to better understand not only the challenges ahead, but perhaps why we are where we stand today. Uh, for example, what, what you can see on the left is really the, um, the very close connection between the growth in GDP, energy, and oil. Um, and an obvious way of saying that would be that obviously the ups and downs somehow of GDP are followed by an increasing or decreasing use of energy, and in the case of modern capitalism of oil, which already poses a problem, which is the fact that so far we haven't decoupled economic growth at all from energy and oil consumption, if you look at it from a global perspective. Uh, but even more importantly, what some ecological economists and some biophysical economists say is that the growth of GDP itself is largely determined by your technological ability somehow to find um, new sources of energy, which is an idea that may be quite radical if we see it from MMT, but the idea that, uh, that's put forward by some biophysical economists such as uh, Robert Iris or War is really that we're already in some era of relative scarcity that I will develop a bit further that may also explain some of the trends uh, that we observe from a, a macroeconomic perspective. Um, the other, the graph on the right just shows some correlation with no explanation obviously, but some correlation between the, the price of oil in the real price, oil price in the, in the black line um, the relative cost of oil as percent of GDP in the gray bars and the occurrence of economic recession. So the, the idea I propose here is really to try to better understand how could we work on a framework that aim as, uh, aims at better understanding these kind of correlations. Um, and what last thing I guess that's very important is really to understand that uh, so far most of the work of economists on environmental issues, including heterodox economists, have focused on climate change. Uh, and not to say that climate change is a hoax, not at all, but we should remember that it is only one out of many challenges we're facing today. Um, some scientists have put together the, the concept of the nine planetary boundaries that you can see here, which I think is a very uh, important and useful one to remember how uh, these problems are much more in climate change, but also interconnected among themselves. And if you look at the one on the upper left, for example, uh, the red area refers to the fact that we're curr currently going through the sixth uh, mass extinction in biodiversity on the history of the planets, and the first one uh, caused by one species on the others, which is humans. So that poses a radically different set of challenges than just saying that we're still fine, it's not too late for climate change. Um, one way of connecting, and don't think it's the only one, but one way of connecting um, ecological economics and MMT is what is called a socio-ecological approach, which has three components. One is a rather technical one. In my case, I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of relative oil scarcity. And basically, it's a, I would say that the technical approach belongs to the field of environmental science and geophysical science to, to some extent. The second one is an institutional component, which argues that um, we cannot understand natural resources simply as an input to our socioeconomic systems, but we really need to understand how these natural resources have shaped different social and economic behaviors. And I'm gonna talk about the institutionalization of oil in that case to realize that the challenges ahead are perhaps more structural than we can think sometimes. And the third one, I won't have time to touch upon it today, but it's an equity issue, uh, which recognizes or acknowledges that environmental and social justice are uh, much more connected than we often acknowledge. And you've been touching a, a little bit upon that, but I think there's also some north-south top of injustice that's, that uh, are also part of the, of the picture. So with all these elements in mind, the question I wanted to ask here, which can be 
sound a bit um, um, too ambitious, perhaps, but I think it's an important one, is to understand to which extent could we argue that some, socioecolog some socioecological dimensions may have contributed to the transition somehow to a financialized economy or to what Minsky called uh, money manager capitalism. I'll start with why I think this is an important or at least relevant question. Um, usually when we think about the 70s or even more so about the 80s, we already know it among MMT scholars at large, I would say, uh, several trends such as the, the rise in importance of finance in the general management of the economy, the decrease in or the, the lower growth in labor productivity, the gap between workers' wages and labor productivity, etc. There's another radical shift that we don't comment that much, which has to do with energy in high income economies. Here it's for the US, UK, Japan, Germany, and France. Um, and what we see here is a decrease in energy intensity. In practice, it should be exergy intensity, but for this purpose, I put energy so, so that we can simplify. Um, which means that if we look at the case of the US, which is the, the line at the top, for example, each dollar of GDP in 2000 required a much less important quantity of energy than it did in 1970. And the way we could assess that, uh, one is to say that we had tremendous increases in energy efficiency, which is uh, an argument that is put forward sometimes by some mainstream, I would say, environmental economists, arguing that there is some environmental cosmetic curve, that basically the, the pollution or energy intensity gets better after a certain level of wealth. Or obviously we can think of the oil shock of 73, 79, without a clear explanation of why we would have such a prolonged uh, trend over these decades. Uh, in practice, and I think it's been mentioned, that's not going to surprise you, what really happened is that there have been some energy efficiency again, but the real reason is really the outsourcing of industrial production uh, to developing economies. Where, so basically the high income economies end up on average uh, with a GDP composition tilted towards services or tertiary sectors activities which typically require less energy. Um, However, we still have another way of interpreting that that has been emerging in a very transdisciplinary field, I would say, over the last five years at most, which I find quite surprising and coming from environmental history, environmental sociology, among others, which argues that the model of development of somehow the, what we call the Keynesian Golden Age was running into some sort of energetic structural limits. So that would be a whole different set of argument arguing that the transition that we, scar we start seeing in the 70s, in the 80s, could be better understood uh, in their energetic context somehow. Um, in particular, with regard to oil. So I have to, I'll try to be brief here, but using this socio-ecological approach that I developed before, um, in the first, play we, first place, we need to understand why oil was so central to the build-up uh, of what we could call the, somehow the for this Keynesian uh, welfare state regime, if you want. Um, the first key role of oil is really as a source of heat energy, mostly in the transformation of commodities in heavy industrial production. A second one, which is an even more important one, I think, is what uh, Huber calls um, a specific geography of the wage relation, and he refers in part to the, um, for example, to the American lifestyle somehow based on suburbs and driving to work, but even more importantly, to a conception of um, mobility that we have today as some sort of key com as a key component of human agency or almost as a human rights that has been enabled by an oil-based infrastructure. So these are things that we need to recognize when we talk about renewable energy, how can we replace them one-to-one, -one, uh, or do we need to rethink about the concept of mobility, for example. And the third one is that oil was a critical component of some key invention of the, the second industrial revolution. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of fertilizers, which had a tremendous importance uh, leading to a very high increase in uh, agricultural pro um, productivity and output, at least until a few decades ago, it's not so clear right now, um, which had enabled somehow a never decreasing rural population to feed a never increasing urban population that could technically work in factories. So what I suggest here is not to say that oil has determined the, the Keynesian uh, golden age, but really that we need to understand its centrality in enabling it or making it possible. And some authors I wouldn't necessarily agree, but go as far as 
recasting the Keynesian Golden Age somehow as a carbon democracy, which is a concept that I found a bit far to fetch, but it's uh, quite uh, striking. Um, if we look at the case of the US in particular, what we see is that shortly after the crisis of 1929, uh, the real problem was an overproduction of oil, in part of because of the crisis, but mostly because some new oil fields had been discovered, and they were actually the, the biggest oil fields that have ever been discovered in the, in the history of the US to this day, um, which contributed to a plunge in the price that you can see here to such an extent that the governors of uh, Oklahoma and Texas declared martial law in oil wells in 1931, and you may be aware of that. Uh, and at the same time, Roosevelt's interior secretary issued a report where he called for the establishment of an oil dictator, in his own word, who could rescue prices and save the general economy in his terms. So there was a real concern about how do we institutionalize this abundance of energy that is posing a problem to our economic system, which I think is a quite important um, aspect. So what followed from that was that the US established a complex institutional setup, which has often been referred to as the interstate cartel, uh, consisting in, fed in federal level and state level agencies, which basically allocated oil production quotas across oil wells uh, all around the country um, to basically with the idea of maintaining oil prices within a range that could, uh, that could be high enough, the so basically ensuring a price high enough to make sure that oil companies would make profits and remain in activity, but also a price of oil that would be low enough uh, so that manufacturers could make profits and even more importantly so that workers could spend their wages on cheap mass consumption goods. So the, re the, uh, the idea behind that is really, as Huber says, the idea of fueling the wage relation during the Keynesian Golden Age. And I think that's a very important concept to put out there uh, when we think about the link, perhaps, between money from an MMT perspective and the energetic context within which in it takes place. Um, in, the 60, what we in the 60s, what, what we observe in the US is that the, the country runs into some sort of internal and external limits. Um, internally, what we see is that oil consumption was increasing much faster than new discoveries, and that the US basically transitions from uh, producing uh, about two thirds of the world oil in 1945 to, as you probably know, becoming a net importer in the 60s and reaching its own peak <coughs> oil in 1970. And externally, perhaps even more importantly, the US loses control of oil abroad because of nationalization in Latin America and then Uh, anecdotal 
the matter where the IMF issued a report in 2011 dealing with the, the prospect of higher scarcity, and they almost seem to validate somehow the hypothesis against their own will, arguing that in case of uh, oil scarcity, relaxing employment policy could be a useful strategy. So I think it's a, a rather uh, thought by, by itself. Um, I won't have much time here really to discuss about how we could um, envisage or how, how can we foresee what, what will come next based on this different assessment that I've tried to present here. The key idea being that ecological challenges are not just a new, um, a new challenge that appear out of nothing, but may have broader connection with the financial and economic system um, we live in. And some of the issues that I found here, um, one of them is around renewable energy, which is really the, the main focus of uh, economists, um, where we have different opinions on whether renewables are already um, cost efficient or not. But the fact is that the EROI, which is the energy return and energy invested ratio of renewables, on average remains a bit lower than fossil fuels, and especially than the fossil fuels of the 70s and, and even in the 90s, uh, except for hydro that you see here, but we could have a, a debate on whether hydro should be there. Um, so that's, and even if technology improves, renewable are still intermittent sources of production that cannot be produced whenever and wherever you want. And as I suggested before, they cannot replace some key uses of fossil fuels, including fertilizer. Um, another quite uh, important challenge, I believe, has to do with energy efficiency that we often also hear as a very important strategy that can definitely generate a lot of profits from a micro perspective. But if you look at it from a macro perspective, we often see that there is uh, what is called a rebound effect, where the gains of energy efficiency often end up being spent into more energy intensive type of activities. So canceling somehow the, um, the initial gains. And finally, a lot of investment that we are in sectors such as ecosystem protection that basically don't generate uh, physical capital at all, where it is really about protecting an existing ecosystem rather than creating anything new. So I put this sentence by an ecological economist, Tim Jackson, who said that most investment appear to soak up income without increasing, increasing economic output. And I think it's debatable from an energy perspective where there's this idea that we soak up an existing income and we can't do anything about it. But on the other hand, I think it also gives an idea of the fact that no matter how, money, how much money we can uh, create or issue into a system, there will be some energetic constraints that we're facing uh, and that we need to face uh, quite urgently today if you remember the, um, the idea of planetary boundaries that I've, uh, I've presented before. So I think that the key point for me is really how we do we think about a more integrated framework. And I would say for MNT and post and theory, the, the, perhaps one of the um, topics on which we, we should be more <coughs> and more together is really how to endogenize land and nature and not see, see it as something completely external, as just an external, externality, basically. Um, and for socioeconomic system in the global north and high income economies, I think Stephen has been talking about that, but I think there's a real question um, as to how much we still want to grow or whether we, we are facing a whole set of different questions. I'm glad you brought all these issues before. So I think that's all for now. Thank you. Hegemon's hegemony without looking at their energy content. 
literature that I was referring to a few um, scholars sorry, have re recently argued that there is historically a connection between energy surplus and monetary hegemony, and that one, that the, the latest that basically uh, monetary hegemony cannot survive or cannot resist without energetic surplus, uh, and especially Sager, Jerry Sager has been working on that. Um, I think it's, there is a deeper link, I think, that we need to be thought of between MMT and and, and, and energetic issue because the problem of this literature is that it often re reflects or work with the rather mainstream framework, uh, whereby the argument you find is that, for example, the loss of energy sovereignty leads to a trade deficit, and then you run into all this uh, debt issue when you won't have your sovereignty anymore. But so, so it's kind of like not fully convincing, in my opinion, this kind of relationship. Uh, but it needs to be better explored, I think. I don't have like, a natural response to such a big, I would say, topic. I have a comment for Mark, um, and then a question for the panel. So, um, I just want to say, I, I really like your paper, and I've always been a skeptic, we talked a little bit offline, but I've always been a skeptic of carbon, like taxes and carbon sort of cap and trade systems, because of the distributional fears. But I think your paper shows that there's ways to do good policy design. So um, I can find that paper online, I imagine. When you yeah. describe the methodology for details, I'll have to ask that question right now. Great. Um, so thank you for that. Well, my question is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is like, you know, Stephen, you picked up on this idea of like the limits of growth arguments, and you kind of rounded it out with this sort of energy centric kind of, mm -hmm. kind of piece. like. Is is getting to that sustainable place consistent with capital? Uh, I don't know. I think that the way I would think about it is maybe using some sort of Polanian perspective. If we, if we argue that capitalism is on the one hand the commodification of money, um, labor, and land. So my question would rather be like, so far what we've seen in the history of capitalism is some sort of counter movements in money, if we think about the whole Bretton Woods Agreement, taking out the, the finance share out of the temple somehow, um, and on labor. And we've never seen a counter movement on land or nature. So would it be a non-capitalist system? I'm not sure. I think that we definitely need to have non-capitalist counter movements for the protection of nature, that I'm, I'm sure of. And could it be consistent or compatible with the capitalist system? I guess it could, but in a different one, a different sort of capitalism. If I can comment on that and also ask a question to, to primarily you, but both of you. Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I actually don't see it as incompatible with capitalism. I mean, I think that capitalism is an incredibly dynamic system. I guess it, I guess the question is, what do you mean by capitalism? And then, and then, you know, right? That, that's a slightly different conversation, but I don't think we could directly answer that question. I don't think that the two are inherently at odds in any way. Right. You know, whether or not we, we regulate markets, and I think it's a question of how we regulate those markets and where we allow markets to exist. Because uh, at the end of the day, markets exist because the government allows them to exist. Um, and then, I mean, my, my question with your presentation is, I don't fully understand why we need to posit ecological limits to be at odds with growth. Um, I don't think that that need be the case. And that's absurd. <laughs> no, uh, I, I just don't. Um, I, I think that uh, historically, uh, we've certainly seen that that has been the case today. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that need be the case. I would um, like to ask you a question in return, which is, is it possible for the scale of economic activity of one planet to grow forever. I mean, not just over the next 10 years, but over the next 10,000 years. Can the scale of economic activity, because I'm not saying, I'm the sci I know what the scientists say, I also know that I teach people how banks work, and I'm not an expert, or I know virtually nothing about environment, ecological science and, and 
what these guys are talking about. But when uh, respected scientists and almost the consensus, I think, among them say that we need five planets to support sustainably the level of per capita consumption in a country like the US. I just wonder how, I wonder how long they can be. And I don't believe decoupling is possible. I don't think it's consistent with what Philip was talking about earlier, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. I think there is some limit. Uh, I don't think it's possible to, even if we're producing services, um, you know, if I'm, if, if, if it's personal services, we still need other resources we need. Even if you, even if you're going to, if you can avoid waste and we can recycle, you can never do that perfectly. There must, I think scientifically, there must be a limit. I don't know where that limit is. I know these guys say we're well past the limit. I have no reason to believe that they're not right. So, but I was, I think I was taking an agnostic approach, and I think I would ask of other people to take the same agnostic approach as me. I don't know the answer to that question, but I am, I, I, I am, I am confident that the answer is not. We can definitely grow here. I'm just maybe add one, one little thing to the, the previous comments you made um, about regulate, regulating markets. Um, I think that's one, and maybe that relates to your previous question as well. Um, if you think about Eleanor Ostrom and the whole school of Indiana that of literature, that also has something which is the idea of the commons, which is precisely something that is both out of public and private. It's neither state versus market, it's something else true about protecting the commons. And I would say that that's precisely perhaps what I was referring to as well. How do we create a counter movement there? Do we have to regulate the commons? Do we have to privatize them? Or do we have to let them be commons and make them work as commons? And I think that the literature of uh, Austrian history literature is wonderful in this sense, as it shows that the commons usually cannot be better managed under either public or private governance, but really when a certain set of institution and behavior are respected. And it could be private, it could be public, but in general, it is a comment in practice, although it doesn't exist legally. So I would say that's another challenge somehow to, to this state market approach. Okay, do we have one more question? Yes? Okay, well, one more. Oh, okay. I think we'll make it to the last one. Okay. I just had a question about the carbon tax. In your example, you had it at $50 a ton. Do you think that is high enough to actually change behavior? Uh, uh, yeah, so. Because, like, is it Sweden's, like, I don't know, 150 or I have? Yeah, so. Uh, uh, so, uh, absolutely not. Uh, it, it's a, a place to start. Uh, so in the paper, we model two different taxes. We model fifty dollars, and then we model two hundred. And two hundred, I also don't think is is probably sufficient. Uh, the reason we take uh, two hundred is it's the, the the mean estimate internationally of uh, what we need for a more robust. Uh, if we were actually to price in a full social cost of carbon, so one thing the social cost of carbon misses is what we call co-benefits. However, social cost of carbon is simply pricing in the negative externality from polluting carbon. It's not asking the question, which is a very different question, what price of carbon do we need to rapidly transition to 100% renewables? Um, if that's the question, we're talking about you know, many hundreds, if not a you know, $1,000 price of carbon. Um, right now, the $50 price of carbon is estimated to reduce emissions by about 15%. Um, something, but uh, nowhere near sufficient. I think it's important to make a distinction between quantitative and qualitative growth. So you can't have sustained quantitative growth in perpetuity because there are thermal dynamic limits. There are sort of entropic limits. There's a trophic structure. But you can have qualitative growth, right? That, that says we can, we can change your activities and we can put these people here to do this stuff and we can you know, reformulate our 
not talking about real GDP anymore. Exactly. They're not talking about We're not talking about capitalism anymore. So talking about real GDP, you're basically talking about a physical quantity. You keep the price level constant over time. It's impossible to increase real GDP sustainably mm -hmm. over time. Yes, we can increase welfare over time, yep. but that's not real GDP. That's what the genuine progress indicator is an alternative to GDP. Which is a good, a good, a good way to wrap up. It, it is. This is a great example of when this kind of panel is useful. I mean, that's, this has been my experience uh, in my economics.